us first, we're, as the Parkinson's Wellness Project, we're based in Rockland County. We do have a studio here. We do teach rock steady boxing in Pomona, New York at our studio, and it is a hybrid class, meaning we also have it on Zoom. We also have two other amazing teachers. Um, Alex Tresser does PD and um, Cecilia Fontanese does a dance movement class. And we're very proud of our teachers. Um, and we don't want to keep them a secret anymore. We're welcoming people to come to our class. Everything's over Zoom. It just might be. You just tell me if, oh, here's the schedule. Uh, we have a three o'clock boxing class. Tuesdays, we have a, a women's boxing jury. Wednesday, we have 9.30 with Alex PD on the move. Um, and as you can see, we have plenty of room for everybody and we don't want to keep our wonderful teachers a secret. The other thing is we have an amazing uh, program coming up. It's also in person in Rockland County and on Zoom. It's this, it's Sunday, March 10th. It's a week from this Sunday. Um, and we're welcoming Wild Cornell. We're doing a whole discovery series on different healthcare systems in the New York tri-state area. So this uh, March 10th, it's going to be at the hotel, the Crown Plaza, with a brunch and two fantastic doctors. We also have an incredible, because we're, be we're going to be talking about stress and management, we have an incredible breathing expert who will be doing some breathing exercises with us. And I know Dr. Kabasa, I want to tell you about the what we'll be doing a breathing whole workshop soon. No, this is great, great to hear. And I'm very interested, the two doctors that you're featuring, I know very well. They're very special, aren't they? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So now I want to thank Abby for sponsoring our webinar and um, for, for appreciating all the work that we do. And I'm very happy to have Dr. Jose Cabasa here with us today. He's a board certified and movement disorder specialist. And he is a ringside physician, founder of the Moving Brains Foundation. And I love this about him because he came up with this concept himself. It's he he knows how important exercise is. And he put himself in the ring with a boxing studio with two professional teachers in Harlem, New York. I'm not sure if your classes are just uh, in person only or Zoom. You'll you'll yeah. Yeah, we're um, in person, but we're we're trying to develop um, our online presence as well. Yeah. Absolutely, and and they're professional bo boxers, so um, you'll learn more about that. He graduated from Temple Temple School of Medicine in Philadelphia and trained as a neurologist in the University of Maryland at uh, in the Shock Trauma Baltimore VA Medical Center. He received additional training in Parkinson's at Beth Israel Mount Sinai and was an assistant professor of neurology at SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn. Dr. Kabasa has been treating people with PD for more than 20 years. He looks much younger <laughs> and specializes in managing complex motor and non-motor complications. His clinical practice name is Moving Brains. And that's what we're gonna learn about today reflecting his focus on mobility, function, and well-being to enhance our quality of life and decrease injuries. So I want to welcome Dr. Jose Cabasa talking about a very important subject with us today. And I know at the end of his talk, we will welcome questions. Thank you, Dr. Cabasa. Yes, yes. Thank you for having me. Let me just adjust very quickly uh, um, one of the windows so I can have a better view of the, the slides. And um, just um, just a little disclaimer. I am um, is I'm a, a, a trained uh, neurologist and Parkinson specialist. I am not trained in blood pressure, but it's something that I took on my own uh, in terms of learning. Um, I was trained in blood pressure management, maybe post stroke, once after somebody has a stroke. But I figured that you know I need to learn about this before people get stroke or heart attacks or any of those bad things. Um, so we can actually prevent these the, these problems. Um, so the other thing is that I'm not. This is not meant to be uh, any um, specific uh, recommendations. I um, mean, you know, I'm talking in general, and you know, any any recommendation, any thoughts, you know, that are um, or any questions that are more um, personal, uh, you know, you should discuss with your 
primary care or, or Parkinson's specialist, even though unfortunately some of these topics, you know, are not something that they're well aware of. So it's something that we're also trying to create some conscience about um, just to have everybody on board and 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 help uh, help our uh, Parkinson's fighters as best as we can. So um, so I'll be talking about blood pressure, pulse, and Parkinson's, and, and you know, and and some of the concepts I. Um, I don't want to go into uh, a lot of technical details. I want to make this as, uh, you know, as friendly as possible. Uh, so I'll try to, I might go by some things very quickly, uh, but, and the more important things are going to be written in red. So uh, um, let me, let me go ahead and this forward. So, um, so why, why does it matter? Why, you know, why does blood pressure problems in people with Parkinson's matter. Um, and basically, uh, excuse me, because I still can't see my, I can't see you guys right now, but um, I'm just gonna go ahead and if anything, uh, Susan, just kind of, you know, interrupt screen. me verbally. Did you put uh, on your screen? Did you put on your slides? Because I don't see them. Okay, let me just take a quick look again, sorry. And, expert in Parkinson's and a okay oh there we go you got it okay here we go there all we right go. um go back so all right so so why does this topic matter and I think uh, very quickly we're going to learn that um it's very important as it, as you know having blood pressure problems and Parkinson's increases the risk for falls increases the risk for dementia. And it's a 14% conversion per year uh, with some blood pressure problems. Um, increases the risk of heart attack and stroke, which is often not necessarily framed um, in terms of Parkinson's, you know, leading, you know, an increased risk of these, of these conditions. And very importantly, it decreases the quality of life and, and survival. So, so, uh, um, so obviously, you know, this is what I'm gonna try to convince you today. Um, why does it matter to you, to anybody? Is because we can do something about it, and that's that's where our red, uh, our, you know, take action points or tap are going to be highlighted. And and if, if anything, that's what you guys should be focused on, um, as I as I um, as I talk or hopefully not ramble. Um, so what's one of the so what's the problem um, with blood pressure? And I think that very uh, very quickly we can um, visualize this as as staring at the tip of the iceberg. So. So I, I like to show this slide. It's it's just published in Neurology in in last year, um, and it shows the typically the 24-hour blood pressure um, variations in somebody with Parkinson's, um, and they also include people with MSA, multiple sensors atrophy, which is a Parkinson's plus syndrome that features, um, you know, that that by definition has a lot of problems with blood pressure. So, as we see. Um, and blood pressure is, is is throughout the day of somebody with Parkinson's may be extremely variable. You know, the analogy is that it, it might be like the 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 the, the, the stock exchange. Um, but one important feature, like if if um, looking, let's say, if somebody goes in to see their doctor in the morning, they're getting one blood pressure. Um, and let's say, you know, at this point, they might get a blood pressure and the doctor might say, oh, it's beautiful, it's 120 over 80. That's what the definition says that everybody should be. Um, without necessarily realizing that throughout the rest of the day, there might be incredible fluctuations, not only on the low side, but also on the high, on the high side where, where the blood pressure might be increasing or, or decreasing um, to abnormal um, uh, levels to, to either to the hypertensive range or so high blood pressure or to the hypotensive range to so the low blood pressure. So, so, so we, you know, so the first problem is we're staring at this tip of the iceberg and, and we need to understand then what, you know, what is blood pressure then, what is heart rate, what, you know, how does these things work in order to have a better grasp and understanding of how can we tackle this challenge. Right, so um, so let's review, and this is a very busy slide, and I will try to go through it very quickly, but concisely, um, and just going through very basic definitions. So when we talk about pulse, we're talking about your heartbeat, um, and the heart rate. Um, when we talk about heart rate, it's beats per minute, so BPMs. So how many times your heart beats per minute? Um, very similar to uh, to beats per minute in music, and I mentioned that because. Um, 
there seems to be a very interesting phenomena uh, with dancing that if we are dancing something that's rhythmic and we are dancing to the rhythm, let's say to a BPM of, of, of 80 beats per minute, our heart rate actually you know, kind of reaches that and trains into the 80, 80 beats per minute. So it's kind of a neat trick if you're, uh, as we talk later about um, you know, heart rate targets uh, for exercise, for example. So, um, so when when and the normal rhythm of the heart is anywhere from sixty to one hundred, anything uh, above it, you know, then started to consider tachycardia, um, and which most people experience as palpitations, and uh, um, and below sixty, it's hypotension, and 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 those symptoms are very variable, and and we'll be discussing them very shortly as well. Um, blood pressure, uh, you know, which is something that our doctors check all the time and they tell us, you know, we must be this number. Um, it is really the force, um, you know, the heart, you know, as it contracts with the force that it creates on the artery wall. So, when, you know, the top number, the systolic number is when the heart is pumping, is contracting and diastolic and, and when it's relaxing. So these are kind of the basic concepts that the, we, we're going to build upon. And, um, and at the end of the day, you know, the, the challenge of the system is that the brain and the body needs a steady supply of oxygen and nutrients to function, you know, uh, through blood, which is, you know, which, uh, which is being um, transferred through our cardiovascular system by our heart rate and our blood pressure. So, so our goal is to maintain blood, you know, and we want to perfuse, we want to always, you know, all our organs need blood pressure constantly all the time. So we want to make sure that, you know, that we maintain blood pressure as steady as possible. And, and, you know, so that that's, you know, whether we're lying down, standing, whatever we're doing, we, you know, the goal, one of the goals of our bodies is to maintain blood pressure as steady as possible. And one of the ways that it does it is by, by, is by our heart rate adjusting. And, um, and the concept of heart rate variability is going to, it's, it, it continues. And I, I predict will continue to be very important, a very important measure, um, because this is what allows us to, um, to look at fitness in individuals, whereas somebody with a high heart rate variability, um, you know, it, it tends to be have more flexibility and resilience when we're talking about um, physical ability and decreases in heart rate variability is what we see um, with cardiovascular disease, and depression, anxiety. I mean, a lot of different things. Poor sleep, for example, it decreases your heart rate variability. So, so at the end of the day, or, you know, one of the most important measures of fitness. Um, is going to be heart rate variability. And an example of heart rate variability and something that we can tap to eventually, and, and, and I'm very curious to know, you know, with these, these, um, these, these upcoming lectures about breathing, um, you know, they're, they're likely going to be based on, on an example of heart rate variability um, that occurs every, all the time is that is when we breathe in and we, we breathe out. So, so um, when we breathe in, our heart rate tends to slightly increase. And when we breathe out, our heart rate tends to decrease. Um, and this is a part of what's called the, the autonomic nervous system, which is the automatic nervous system. It's, it's what, um, is, is what makes our heart beat us, us to um, automatically breathe. Um, and it's divided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic. I don't want to get too much into this. You probably, some of you might have heard about all these, all these terms, but, um, but at the end of the day, one of the, one of the very interesting things of when we can tap into, into these, uh, concepts is what's called the physiologic sigh, which is a, a very rapid way of, of decreasing your heart rate. You know, especially if, let's say, if, if, if you're feeling that your heart rate is going too fast, if you have palpitations, if you're feeling stressed. Um, and it, so it's, it's really the most, the quickest anxiolytic intervention we could do, which is, you know, as we know, as we expire, you know, our heart rate decreases. So what we want to do is, is do two quick inhalations to fill our lungs. One, one inhalation, one fast inhalation doesn't fill our lung, but then two does, and then we are long exhale. And that eventually what it does, it, it starts lowering their heart rate. Yes. This is an excellent card. I feel like everybody should print this out. You know, we, uh, maybe you'll send this to me as a PDF. It's, it's uh, like you're teaching us very well. Thank you. Uh, okay. You know, and these are very difficult concepts. I have to admit, I mean, it, it's very hard to put it in, you know, to, to make it friendly uh, because we can get into the weeds here, but um, 
Uh, but this is the sort of thing I worry about, and that's in the background when I'm, you know, when I I am um, uh, observing my patients in the class, and when I'm making adjustments. These are the type of things that I'm really interested in um, as I'm measuring, and I want to measure their fitness and, and their abilities, especially as they get better. So, mm -hmm. so absolutely. Well, this um, is what's amazing about having you in the gym once a week with the with your patients is that you're there while they're exercising and you can monitor them in this way. It's a great idea. Yes, no, I mean, it's, it's you know, I, I realize I'm going into space, into other people's spaces, but but uh, but I'm, I'm friendly and I'm, I'm a collaborative. So, so this is meant to be, um, yes, I mean, this is, um, and I'm, I'm even as of now, I'm trying to always define my role there, you know, make sure that I'm relevant in there. And I hope that I am. And certainly these are the type of things that, that, um, that, that I look into. Um, so one concept now just to move on is to, you know, so, you know, so we are moving brains and that's really, you know, going back to that term, you know, we need to adapt. And, and one of the concepts of blood pressure, um, that I like to talk about is, is what happens you know, what happens to our blood pressure? Because when we they take our blood pressure, it's just one snapshot in time as we're sitting down. That's right, that, that's, the, the, that's the typical way um, they take our blood pressure. And then from there, you know, they potentially, doctors make, make lifelong decisions about our health just on that number. Of course, it should be that, you know, it, that it's consistently high, not just on one reading um, and in one doctor's visits, but, uh, but but still at rest, you know, we, we do like our blood pressure to be around 120 over 80. But, uh, but the concept is that as we move around, our blood pressure actually is changing constantly and adjusting and understanding that often it, um, leads to better understanding of blood pressure management. So as we stand, um, our blood pressure goes up a little bit, then it goes down and then, it, and then within 20 to 30 seconds, it goes, it, 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 it's supposed to um, go back to the, you know, to a similar blood pressure when you were sitting so so let's say if you're if you're if your blood pressure is 120 over 80 as you stand very quickly you know it might go up to 130 over 90 then it might go up to one you know 10 over 70 and then within 20 or 30 seconds it's back to one one 120 over 80 that's again typically what happens now as we walk um um uh, and our heart rate goes up our blood pressure goes up a little bit and when we're exercising as we're exercising, our blood pressure can actually even be in the hypertensive range. So, so I mean, our systolic blood pressure can reach anywhere from 160 to 220. So right off the bat, just the context of when are you taking the blood pressure, you know, can make a world of difference. Of course, if, if your blood pressure is elevated while you're exercising, that, that, that could be completely normal. As long as when you then, you know, sit down and rest, you know, that it comes back down in, in a timely fashion. Um, also when we do other things in life that we have to do every day and, and, um, when we, for example, have to go to the bathroom, when we urinate, when our blood is full or our heart rate goes up a little bit and our blood pressure goes up a little bit. Um, when we have a, a bowel movement, um, it's very, it's similar to standing there, 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 there's changes in blood pressure, changes in heart rate. Um, and when we eat, um, you know, heart rate tends to go up and our blood pressure tends to go down. And, and a lot of, you know, in, in, we're going to see that in Parkinson's, some of these phenomena, the problem is that they're amplified. So as we eat, the blood pressure goes down too low. And, and maybe, for example, the heart rate doesn't, um, cannot compensate. Um, and, and, and often that's when people, after a, a big meal, you know, they stand too quickly, they might start feeling um, dizzy or lightheaded and, and eventually pass out. Um, so another very important, actually, this is probably the most important, uh, uh, point, at least in my practice is what happens when you're sleeping, because if we don't know, we don't care about what happens when we sleep, we're going to miss, you know, we're going to miss an opportunities to get better in much easier ways than if we just focus on when we're awake. Now that's a challenge, you know, how do we, how do we worry about um, our vitals or our, our blood pressure heart rate when we sleep? Um, because it's very important that when we're, when we're lying down, when, when we fall asleep, that our blood pressure, heart rate and temperature go down. Um, and if, it, if, if any of these don't go down, there's gonna be a problem. Um, and and it's sleep and, um, um, is very, very important for blood pressure control 
um, and as we'll see for memory as well and for many things. Um, and each stage we know now that, um, you know, each stage where we divide uh, sleep in, let's say, light sleep, deep sleep, and REM sleep. REM sleep is when we're dreaming. Um, they're very, very important. And I, I was briefly mentioning um, to Susan uh, before we started that I'm experimenting on, on, on a device called the Aura Ring, which is a, it's, it's a ring that you wear in your finger um, then that, that is able to give you a little bit of the sleep architecture. You know, it, you can, it actually measures your sleep and it tells you how long you spend in deep sleep, how long you spend in REM sleep. And these are going to be, you know, the, this information is going to be very, very important in the future in helping us manage even things like blood pressure, uh, for example. And we know that in, in, in the dreaming stages in REM sleep, it's very important it's, uh, for, um, for us to be in that stage for a good amount of time and to have normal REM sleep because it really sets up our blood pressure control the next day. Um, with Parkinson's, as uh, we might, as you might or might not know, there's uh, a problem in REM sleep, uh, the REM sleep behavior disorder, and and I cannot tell you with certainty, you know, because um, we just started to monitor, you know, sleep architecture. How does this interfere with normal REM sleep? But I think you know these are very important questions that that we're going to be asking and hopefully, um, you know, exploring. Um, and, and really the, the, the take home, you know, the take action points of all of these two slides of this slide, um, is, is that once you start taking blood pressure multiple times a day, you start filling in that picture. If it's just, you know, one, one snapshot a day, you know, versus a couple more points and you start filling out the picture, especially when people have symptoms, that's always a good time to try to have somebody help and, and take their blood pressure. And, and, and this, the nighttime vitals, I mean, as we target the nighttime vitals, this is the, this is the part that I have to try to sell to a lot of doctors to understand this. How do you target for nighttime vitals um, in order for the blood pressure, heart rate, and temperature always to go down? I mean, the temperature is, is, often, a, a, um, is often a result of, of the environment, if, you know, of how you can control the heat in your home. Um, and certainly blood pressure and heart rate can be a lot more complicated and a lot more uh, harder to control uh, based on multiple uh, comorbidities and different you know disease you know problems that people might have so uh, but it's very important and i'm going to show you a way that i that i can i guess uh monitor or worry a little bit about nighttime vitals without having the, the fancy tools yet that that we're trying to get um so um so Let's let's get to now what what what's what's going on with Parkinson's. So the Englishman that keeps on giving. You know, I tell I tell people you know the, the German is Alzheimer's, the Englishman is is Parkinson's. So, um, and one point that I'm I'm gonna interject very quickly is that we what we know actually we uh, that I think um, has been shown is that we if we live to a hundred years old, we might have a little bit of both. You know, so so as we, we ask these questions about even what is Parkinson's, um, you know, we know that, that, that you know, people that reach, you know, uh, really, you know, I, I, you know, so a lot of the par problems with Parkinson's also end up being problems with aging, I guess it's the point. And, and, and at, at sometimes it's not really, you know, it's very hard to separate uh, uh, both. So. When we talk about Parkinson's and specifically non-motor problems, you know, so motor problems being, you know, the tremors, this, the, the, the slow movements, the stiffness, the balance problems. Um, we also, and, and most people with Parkinson's know this very well, you know, often the non-motor problems end up being more problematic or equally as problematic. And they include things as constipation, um, urinary problems, sexual dysfunction, sweating changes. And really unstable blood pressure and i like to use that maybe more general term unstable blood pressure because as we're going to see it's not just that are you know it's not just orthostatic hypertension which a lot of people have heard about uh, but very importantly it's also supine hypertension so um one thing one 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 thing to note about uh people with parkinson's is that very early on this 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 must have been done in the 80s and the 90s um, there was a very fancy um, test that people would get and that would show people with Parkinson's early cardiac sympathetic denervation. And what that means is that some of the nerves from the autonomic nervous system going into the heart 
um, seem to be affected even, you know, even very early in Parkinson's. Um, and uh, it's always been very hard for me to get a straight answer in the literature about what are the consequences of this, even though um, they're becoming quite obvious, you know, as we, um, as we learn more about uh, even exercise, um, you know, and, and what, what goals we can reach um, in people with Parkinson's. So, Talking about the cardiovascular alterations, about 80%, uh, and I apologize, I didn't, I didn't include the, the references for this, but about 80% of people with Parkinson's might experience some type of cardiovascular alteration. Um, very commonly is cardiovascular dysautonomia, a fancy term, um, dysautonomia it, 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 um, it includes things like neurogenic orthostatic hypertension. Now, neurogenic orthostatic hypertension, which is a mouthful, um, means that it's not just that um, orthostatic hypertension means that as you stand, your blood pressure changes and it drops. Hypertension means that it drops. Now, the fancy neurogenic word in the front means that it's not just because people are just dehydrated, which can cause orthostatic hypertension, but that there's actually a neurological cause um, that, or at least a neuro neurological contributor as often these things are, are compounded. If you don't, if you're dehydrated and, and you have neurogenic orthostatic hypertension, you know, you, that's, you know, you're, you're, you're just adding um, fuel to the fire here. So about, uh, I guess uh, when they look at these studies cross-sectionally, about 40% of people with Parkinson's can have neurogenic orthostatic hypertension. And I think um, sometimes these figures are misleading because again, uh, you know, orthostatic hypertension is also a complication of aging. So, you know, as, you know, uh, maybe, maybe as people with Parkinson's continue aging, this, this, this percentage, I, I, I would think would start going up um, a lot more. Um, and very importantly, um, other than low blood pressure is the high blood pressure, the supine hypertension that occurs when we lay down. And when we go back to the figure, I'm gonna, which I'm surely gonna show you, you're gonna see a pattern that once that person lays down, there's really an upward trend of the blood pressure um, throughout the night. And remember what I said about nighttime vitals, that's the complete opposite of what we want, um, uh, you know, at night to happen. So, so sometimes even more importantly than orthostatic hypertension is also worrying about supine hypertension. Um, now, other than just the other terms that I added here, postprandial hypotension just means what I what I talked about. When you postprandial means after you eat, you know, a long, especially a large meal, can cause uh, drops in blood pressure. But the, this this other term, nocturnal not dipping dip profile, it, um, I think it's important because what it means is that even if your blood pressure doesn't go up at night, but it stays the same as if you're awake, that's still a problem. It has to go down. So, so not only does it, if it rises, but if it stays the same as, as while you're awake, there's, you know, the, most of the problems um, that, that, that supine hypertension can give, like, you know, are, are going to be very similar, maybe not at a, at a larger scale, uh, but they're there. And another, and, and other maybe more common things that people don't uh, associate with Parkinson's is heart failure and atrial fibrillation. And, and the studies there are not very clear, but there seems to be a trend that people with Parkinson's get more heart failure and are at risk of more atrial fibrillation uh, um, than the general uh, population. So again, as I talked all this rambling about, you know, about explaining about uh, um, different terms, you know, the take action points here is if you have Peter, you have to think about Paul. So if you have neurogenic orthostatic hypertension, you also have to worry about supine hypertension. I think that's really one of the more important points. Again, going back to the nine time vitals, you know, because supine hypertension is going to really, you know, undo any progress that we do, even as doctors. I mean, we could we could keep people as as perfect as we can during the day, and at night they could just undo everything: diabetes control, blood pressure control. Everything can go haywire if you're not sleeping well. And uh, and you know, we don't even have to be rocket scientists to know this that you know how everybody feels after a, a bad night of sleep. So. Um, Again, thinking about these concepts, I think, you know, is going to help us, you know, take action, right? So um, here's the, the figure again. And as we see, as the person is, 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 is starts lying, you know, is in bed, you know, at some point that blood pressure trend starts going up and up and really throughout the night, 
um, into the early morning, that blood pressure, blood pressure is elevated. Now, you guys most likely have, have heard that most heart attacks and strokes occur in, you know, around this time. So this is not a coincidence. This is, and I'm not even sure if this is something that is, um, you know, we know that there's some cortisol release in the, you know, early in the morning. So that, which might drive the blood pressure up, but we don't, we're not even sure. I'm not even sure if this is an artifact of giving all the blood pressure medications in the morning as they're not lasting till the night, you know, till the, you know, till, till this, this period, you know, this critical period when we're seeing an uptick of, of heart, of heart attacks and strokes. So, um, so what can we do? So, you know, so the, the, so first is recognizing uh, orthostatic hypertension. And I really, um, I've been looking at this for 20 years and recognizing the challenges of this because at first symptoms can be quite, you know, quite common, you know, that, you know, as you stand up, you can get dizzy, you can get lightheaded, but then especially after you start, ha after this starts occurring more and more often, it starts becoming more non-specific. It seems to then people start getting fatigue, people start getting orthostatic dyspnea. That means as they get up, they start getting some, some uh, uh, breathe, uh, difficulty breathing. They might get some palpitations or chest pain. They can get what's called a coat hanger headache, which is a pressure in their neck. Um, they can get, you know, they can have darkened inner visions. But the really the most important or and problematic point is that it can be asymptomatic. And because it can be asymptomatic, um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't confer the same risks that we talked about and that we'll we'll review, you know, at the end of, of the talk. So because it's asymptomatic, I mean, we can really just jump to the take action points is that we, you know, and, and, and this is, this is the point of contention where each person is going to have to potentially fight against even their doctor to demand that they take the blood pressure sitting and standing. Everybody, we, I, I, you know, for the past 20 years, I, I don't let a single patient of mine go without taking blood pressure sitting and then standing. Because it just it, it it starts opening up what's actually happening, you know, what's actually happening throughout the rest of the day. It helps me predict, you know, what's happening the the day, and it helps me predict. It helps us predict what's going to happen at night as well. So um, now, part of this, part of the hesitancy, I guess, in doctors and uh, um, me being a doctor myself and a a a professor, uh, ex professor, so I could, uh, you know, so I could you know, be forceful with some of these, with some of the doctors is that because the strict definition of neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, you know, the excuse is we don't have time for that because what that means is that we have to take the blood pressure sitting and then you have to stand up for three minutes without moving. And then we take the second blood pressure. Um, uh, and we, you know, have to admit, I don't, I don't, by definition, I, I don't have time to really check, uh, really neurogenic orthostatic hypertension and everybody consistently. But what I'm doing is um, just by shortening the, the time interval, um, we're, we're still looking, you know, by checking blood pressure sitting. And then I wait about 30 seconds, which is about as soon as people stand is about, you count about maybe to 10 to 15. And then you hit the blood pressure uh, machine, which takes about 15 seconds to, to ramp up. So there's about 30 seconds then um, and, and what we're looking for is delayed blood, pre uh, uh, blood pressure recovery, meaning that if at that point, you know, af after 30 seconds of your standing, your blood pressure is low, is lower than where you're sitting, you know, that starts, you know, that starts, um, that starts, I start worrying that, yes, that the person has orthostatic hypertension, and we can start thinking about what can we, we do about this. So, so again, you know, the time is always going to be the excuse, oh, we don't have time. You know, as long as we just get it sitting and then, you know, stand 10 seconds, get it again. I mean, you're getting something much better than otherwise. So, so um, it's just, I feel very strongly about this. And even, even, um, even one of my, um, one of my mentors, I had the privilege of being trained by, you know, uh, Parkinson's experts, you know, very early on, I asked, you know, should we taking, should we be taking the blood pressure like this for everybody? She was absolutely I don't think they do, you know, about what I, I have. I, you know, I kind of stuck with my guns there. Um, 
And then um, just to kind of quickly go through all these definitions, there's other definitions in it about initial orthostatic hypertension now. The technology there, we can't, we, we can't pick up, you know, this happens within seconds. So these are people that pass out sometimes while, they, while they're sitting or, or a lot of younger people when they pass out. And it's a different mechanism. I mean, sometimes it could be a cardiac mechanism, but, it, but we can't, we don't have the technology uh, yet, at least available commercially to be able to detect this. This happens within seconds. Um, but again, it's less relevant in Parkinson's, you know, the more common thing uh, to have is neurogenic orthostatic hypertension, which is a little bit of slower process and delayed blood pressure recovery and then supine hypertension. I mean, so, so, uh, um, you know, understanding that when we lie down, if our blood pressure is going up, um, that's going to be a big problem. So really, um, the term dysautonomia describes this because what we're describing is not that the blood pressure is going down, it's that it's just unregulated. And, and that has a lot of implications, not just for Parkinson's uh, specifically, but for cognition, for memory, um, and, and for a lot of, the, a lot of other you know, uh, medical conditions as well. So um, now... What's the problem with supine hypertension is that your doctor's not there in your bedroom, you know, taking your blood pressure while after you lay down. It's not taking blood pressure while you're sitting in bed. It's, you know, supine hypertension is measured as you're laying down. Um, so what can we use to give us a clue that we might be having supine hypertension um, when, when we otherwise um, don't have a way to know or don't have the, the equipment of people there checking, you know, while we're trying to sleep? And really, it's seemingly it's turning out there's been some studies now that I've been following um, in China about nocturia, about, you know, getting up to pee at night, right? So now, you know, of course, if you're a man, then you have to worry about the prostate. Um, but it seems that if, if but, it's, but, but especially in women, um, if, if, if you're getting up, you know, one, even one or two times per night, um, you know, I start worrying that there might be supine hypertension. Um, so it's, it's, it's something that, you know, and, and yes, with the man, you can blame the prostate, but actually when the bladder fills, you know, as we, we saw the blood pressure goes up. So it, it, even the prostate, you know, problems can lead to supine hypertension anyway. So, so really it's, it's a very important, um, I guess, uh, phenomenon to look at and to try to intervene. Um, so as we're trying to treat the problem, you know, of, 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 I guess these blood pressure fluctuations, you know, we, again, we have to think about urination at night. And, and really one thing that I tell people is that don't blame your hydration. Everybody thinks, oh, I, I pee a lot at night because I, I'm drinking a lot at night. And I quickly, and this is not, not too quickly, but let me quickly give my answer there. And, uh, I, I give them a, an example. So I tell, I tell my, uh, I tell my, um, my patient, listen, we both drink the same, let's, let's both drink a big glass of water right before we're going to go to sleep. Both of us are going to drink the same amount of water. And if your blood pressure lowers at night, that water is going to circulate in your body and it's slowly going to pass by the, by, by your kidneys. It's going to slowly filtrate and, and go into, you know, you're going to create urine and it's going to go to your bladder. But by the time the bladder is full, it's the morning. Right. So that's what not naturally happens. But if, if with the same amount of volume, the same glass, a big glass of water, um, my blood pressure doesn't go down or it increases, that water is going to circulate in my body much faster. And within a couple of, of, of uh, a couple of uh, hours, that blood is going to be full and I'm going to be waking up at two or three in the morning. So 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 don't blame the water. Now, of course, if you do drink a lot of water, that's, you know, right before going to bed. Yes, you're going to more likely have to urinate a lot. But it's it, it it is a mistake to start cutting down water at night, especially if you're thirsty and 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 you haven't hydrated well. Um, you know, you, you just you know thinking more about what's happening actually at night. I think is going to be more helpful. Now, another problem with going back to the low blood pressure during the day, um, and when we're talking about neurogenic orthostatic hypertension. Um, is that tr we have medications for these. We have um, things like midodrine, fludocortisone. We have even more fancier medications called droxidopa. Um, but with, with my experience, I mean, I know them very well. I, I, uh, I've used them in the past and I barely use them anymore. 
Uh, it's really because they can really worsen supine hypertension and, and it just becomes, you know, just for everything I've been saying, all the, ba all the bad things about supine hypertension, you know, I don't, I don't want to be treating one thing and making another thing worse. And that's sometimes what exactly might be happening. So it's very, um, and anybody that's on these medications, you know, I would tell them to really worry about then their supine hypertension. Uh, and in some cases, it becomes that people have to actually take blood pressure medications at night to lower the blood pressure and then blood pressure medications to raise their blood pressure in the morning. And I honestly, you know, my opinion and clinical experience, it's it's too much of a mess. Actually, I, I believe it actually starts messing with people's memory as well. And it's just something that that's very difficult. So let's talk about what we're going to do now, because, you know, talk about all these bad things and, and, and that might be happening. And, and so like, what are we going to do? So all, so this is my, my red slide. So all of it is our take action points, right? So what are we going to do? What are we going to do about the problems with low blood pressure? What are we going to do with the problems of high blood pressure during the day? Maybe we may be having low blood pressure at night. We might be having high blood pressure. So quick, sort of uh, even this is even based on some Mayo Clinic recommendations, but it's just drinking water upon waking. I mean, if we if we can have this habit and I'm the first hypocrite here that's struggling with this, um, you know, if we create this habit, we're going to have less problems overall throughout the rest of the day. So drinking water, you know, upon waking is, is just a great habit. People with very severe um, uh, severe dysautonomia, people with MSA, the, the Mayo Clinic recommendations um, is for them to bolus uh, a good amount of water, uh, blanking right now on the, on the exact amount, but uh, just in the morning, it's just it bolus means just literally just chug it. Now, me being a little bit more um, realistic, I tell people, you know, try to chug it, try to sip it, but just get the volume in, you know, it doesn't have to be all chugged. Uh, that might itself cause nausea or, you know, it might, might be very unpleasant. And in some cases, salt might be your friend. One of the, the concepts of our class is that we do take blood pressure sitting and standing before we start exercising. And if they're dropping their blood pressure, I, you know, I, I make them hydrate. Um, now, knowing this and, and a lot of our fighters knowing that, I, that I'm a stickler about this, they already come well hydrated. Yet and still, I found that their blood pressure might still be dropping. And at that point, give, I mean, knowing their medical history and, and knowing, you know, their cardiovascular status, you know, at that point, we might add salt. You know, what might be missing in the equation then might be not they're properly hydrating, but now we might need to add electrolytes and very specifically salt. Um, so salt might be your friend in, in many cases. Um, so other ways, things that I've alluded to about uh, avoiding um, low blood pressure when, you know, with meals is just to eat smaller and more frequent meals. Um, very important is to treat constipation and Parkinson's. Understanding that constipation and Parkinson's is very difficult. It's much harder than any the run-of-the-mill constipation. You have to be more aggressive. And even primary care uh, doctors need to understand this. You can't just treat them like anybody with regular constipation. You really have to be more aggressive and really try to avoid straining because that straining can cause uh, uh, excessive, um, the, the straining part of, of, of trying to go is what actually can drop your blood pressure and, and people can actually, um, you know, even pass out while trying to have a, 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 um, a bowel movement. And a lot of people, you know, have experienced maybe not even passing out, but just, you know, knowing that as they're straining, they might start sweating, they might start, you know, their heart might start um, racing and that's a sign that that blood pressure is going down. So the, you know, so by adding some stool softeners often, you know, we can avoid a lot of the straining. Um, another take action point is, is uh, use your muscles. And I'm going to explain that because there's no context there. Um, so use your muscles. So one wonderful thing about movement uh, that I tell people is that the, your heart relaxes more when you're walking than when you're standing. So if you stand still without moving, um, the only thing that pumps that is helping pump blood throughout your body is your heart. But once you start moving, you know, they say your calves become your second heart. They start helping out. And, and uh, even um, we've had people with have very um, severe dysautonomia. Um, very interesting that they, they do a lot of leg exercises, which helps them. Um, but I have one particular patient that once she added some truncal exercises, it seemed to also 
help the blood pressure. So, uh, you know, I have, I have not read this, but my, my assumption is that even some of the chunk of muscles in the arm might be helping also with circulation. So movement is, is always, you know, is always um, going to help, you know, the heart, um, you know, perfuse the body, make sure that, that that blood pressure stays as constant as possible. Um, very, another very severe example, uh, uh, there's, uh, I had a, 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 um, a patient that I presented as a resident that the blood pressure would, as soon as she stopped walking, the blood pressure would plummet and she could, she could pass out right away. So even as uh, when she was, had to cross the street, if the light was red, she had to, she could not stop. She had to kind of keep on circling around because at the second that she stopped, she could pass out. And, you know, and once the, the light turned green, then she would just walk forward, but she could not stop moving. Otherwise her blood pressure, you know, would, would plummet and potentially she would pass out. Another sort of technique that I tell people is that as you're feeling a little bit lightheaded as you're getting up, you know, kind of like, you know, if you, if you can't just walk, but just march in place, you know, and also pump the fist. I mean, going back to the, the, the muscles of the arm, pumping the fist, trying to crunch, kind of like crunch your, your feet, all these things and march in place. All these things are going to also help um, the heart not have to maintain that blood pressure by itself. And, and, and often that's, that's where it can start plummeting. So, so, um, so part of the, you know, part of their solution is to, is to join a lot of these fitness classes and these exercise classes, because that, this is what's going to be helping, you know, our low blood pressure and, and, and these problems. Um, so, and to end with the high blood pressure. So the supine hypertension is to, you know, what, uh, this is where it, it really, I, I want to see better guidelines for uh, people as they age. Uh, I still see the guidelines, you know, we should all aim for 120 over 80. And, and, and this is where that's great when you're, when you're in your 40s, your 50s, maybe in your 60s. But once you start becoming you know, older, like it, it's not as simple as that. Some of the blood pressure medication your doctor um, is giving you might be exacerbating the low blood pressure during the day and allowing for, 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 for supine hypertension at night. So scrutinizing the blood pressure medications and the general trend is that some blood pressure medications can be safely given at night. And, 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 the, and at night is when they become much more effective um, at, at helping us not only for Parkinson's related problems, but for, for things like, like I mentioned, things like stroke, you know, the, you know we actually, you know, we can decrease the risk of stroke and heart attack just by changing the timing of the, of the blood pressure medications. Now that discussion certainly has to be with your primary care or, or cardiologist, um, but it, and it's a, often a very difficult discussion, um, but I, I believe that's where I've had one of the most successes in helping people deal with these problems. Um, just cause um, one thing that I, I, I often, when people talk about Parkinson's, I mean, I talk about a person that has Parkinson's and has other things, not just, you know, it's not just a monolithic Parkinson's, this is what you have, um, right? So um, everybody's very different, not only in their Parkinson's, but in their comorbidities. Other ways of dealing with supine hypertension um, is to monitor sleep, making sure that the quality of your sleep is there and is not being compromised um, because anything that interferes with sleep can potentially interfere with those vitals. So we know that people with obstructive sleep apnea have spikes of blood pressure and heart and, and heart rate during the night. And that's an independent risk factor of stroke. That that, you know, again, it all it all converges to the same story here. Um, that and and I, I had the, the pleasure of talking to a neurocardiologist um, from NYU um, who who was um, who I was mentioning, you know, all the difficulties I have with, with these uh blood pressure medications to raise blood pressure how i don't think i'm not even using them anymore um and he pointed to a study that showed that people's orthostatic hypotension was improving by treating their sleep apnea so again by treating their supine hypertension it seems to then you know uh, it, it seemed to stabilize their blood pressure then into the day um you know rem sleep behavior disorder obviously is part of it could be part of parkinson's 
it's a very challenging condition because it's random. It could happen, you know, it could happen, you know, one day and then not appear in for a couple of months and then all of a sudden come back with a vengeance and then disappear again. And 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 each point where, where you could have an episode, you know, you're at risk of, of falls, you're at risk of injury. But as you're acting out your dreams, which is what happens with REM sleep behavior disorder, your body's not also resting. So those vitals also, we think, are going up as well. You know, blood pressure, heart rate, for example. Um, but these are the studies that we need to be doing soon to, to, to know exactly how this REM sleep behavior disorder is interfering with our sleep architecture. Um, and, and, and just anything like insomnia, obviously, it's, you know, because starts, um, you know, is, is, is by definition, you know, poor sleep or lack of sleep and just pain. Pain is such a, um, is such a, obviously, a universal, you know, symptom that, that is important to address. If I'm, if I want you to rest well and I'm not addressing your pain, then how are you going to rest well if, if you're having pain at night, right? Uh, or if I tell you to exercise and I'm not helping you with the pain, so what am I doing? I'm, I'm just asking you to, to hurt yourself because you're not dealing, you know, because you're not addressing the pain. So, um, so at the end, I mean, um, you know, I guess the take home points is to always try to check your blood pressure sitting and standing. And that starts giving, you know, an idea, it starts opening up what could be happening, you know, at these times and, uh, you know, with blood pressure. And the way that I see it is that if you have, you know, if you have orthostatic hypotension, worry about supine hypertension. Whether you have it or not, if you if you worry about it, or at least or at least think about it, not worry about it that that where it starts causing insomnia, and 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 cut and interfering with your sleep. But, but but understanding or asking your doctor about it, or or, or just you know, uh, or seeing if you're urinating a, a lot at night, trying to understand why is that happening, I think is going to be very very fruitful. Um, to help because it seems that if we focus on the nighttime vitals, a lot of these, you know, and a, a lot of the problems with blood pressure during the day do get seem to get better. Yes, Dr. Cabasa, just uh, our time is running, and yes. so interesting. And I'm just wondering if any of our attendees want to ask any questions. I'm sure there's something um, pressing that you all want to know. Does anybody have any questions? You could either turn you know unmute or write it in the chat and um the sleep apnea was very interesting to me also um i know there's a difference between nose breathing and mouth breathing and mm -hmm. uh, that's something for people to watch out for right yes i mean i i'm not I, I'm familiar that, the, that there's now even devices to try to make sure that you're you're breathing through your nose at night, you know, versus just just your mouth breathing and and you know and that it makes a difference. And um, that, yeah, I'm I'm not that very well versed, but I know it's important, and I'm curious to hear about. Um, Harold, do you have a Harold, do you have a question? Yes, my question was if you have varicose veins, how does that impact any of this? Um, I. It's a good question because it often comes, it, 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 uh, um, and I say it, this, it's a good question, but it's also a cautionary tale for me because uh, a lot of times when people, um, varicose veins are, are being, they, they're blamed for a lot of things that they're not causing, you know? So, so varicose veins tend to be superficial uh, veins, you know, in, in your leg and they're not, for example, if you when we worry about people getting clots, we're talking about the deeper veins in the leg, not about the varicose veins themselves. Um, you know, it's it's the so I don't necessarily think there's an impact he, here, but certainly if you have it, it, it's it, it's it's if you have leg swelling. So, for example, if somebody has varicose veins and have leg swelling, you know, they often they often might see a vascular doctor and at that point they might get intervened. Um, but it, it, um, it, it really, you know, it doesn't, because these are just uh, superficial veins, they doesn't seem to, to play a lot as far as I understand in, into these, into this autonomia. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi. Yes. Uh, this is Ryan. Uh, I have a question uh, for my mother-in-law. Um, 
so so my wife I, apologies uh, uh my wife asked asked me to ask this i'm not sure if i'm saying it correctly but so her her doctor her mom's doctor suggested to take half an amlodipine a m l o d i p i n e before mm-hmm. bed around 8 p.m. um and apparently it is not helping to regulate fluctuating blood pressure uh it still goes high to like 150 and then two hours later it'll go to 90 and that happens continuously throughout the day uh every day and uh usually when you know her blood pressure is low she feels pretty terrible faint uh and it says uh, yeah it says on car be dope join the meeting leave it dopa right um so amlodipine is a type of blood pressure medication. It's, it's called a calcium channel blocker. And uh, there's a general trend to, to use this medication at night. Um, this is one of the blood pressure medications that I, that I am talking about. And um, it, uh, I tend to just tell people to take it at night, not necessarily while they're still awake. So even, you know, um, and again, I have to be very careful because I'm, I'm not trying to get very specific in advice here, but it, it is one of the medications that we use, can be safely used at night. Um, it, you know, the, these sort of problems of whether it still goes down and down might be, it might be um, further adjustments needs to be made. Um, maybe the, the medication itself has to be increased, but given later on at night, for example, you know, that's an example of how you would adjust it. Um, you know, the irony of all this is if you actually read carbidopa levodopa is the main medication for Parkinson's. And the irony of this is if you read the side effects, one of the side effects is hypotension. And so, you know, so it does, we know that, that, that uh, levodopa does cause a little bit of a, of, a, uh, of a drop in your blood pressure. But in the way I, I explain or how do we reconcile this is that we have to move them, you know, so as we move better with the medication, we offset those, you know, those, those drops. So, um, and it's really, you know, uh, the way to reset kind of the, this, you know, the autonomic nervous system, which is what controls this blood pressure fluctuations. You know, it's not going to be a, a magic bullet one day. It, it does take a, a, a good amount of time of combining the right, you know, medication management with, with good exercise. And that's, that's, that's a, the, the inevitable part is that, you know, if the exercise is not part of it. Um, then the chances of success of having a, a more, um, you know, of having the, the blood pressure be more regular, it's just going to be a lot harder. So, so exercise, you know, as we, you know, as I mentioned here, as routine medicine is absolutely necessary for this to work. And this is why it's been such a difficult, um, a difficult problem over the years, because it just can't be solved with a, with a one or two interventions. It can't be solved by one or two pills. It's just really, and you know, it's labor intensive. You have to, you know, monitor the patient. You have to think about how you, you know, create that curve. You know, that that graph that I show you, that's a person. That's not, you know, the numbers is, is is what the was the doctor sees, but that graph what I see is the person. That's what happens to the person, and we're just looking at that, just a little piece of them, and and making decisions at at, at that. I mean, I don't, you know, I by taking blood pressure two times, I'm getting at least. A second point, so I'm still not converting, you know, the the, the the entire picture, but I'm trying to. I'm trying to get there. Um, and, and at the end, it's because you know, remember why this matters is because all you know, this increases the risk of falls. This increases the risk of dementia. This increases the risk of heart attack and stroke, and it decreases our quality of life and our survival. So, so, um, yeah. so it, it, it's as, it's one of the most important things that I that I that I treat. And we can take action, but but we need to be aware of it and and uh, and, and just have better systems to capture this. I know. Thank that, you so much. Thank you. I know the time is running late, but one more question, okay? Um, Brenda is asking the strategies for blood pressure management during exercise. Um. Great question, and 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 it, and a lot of what I do in my class, I have to you know I have to say it's it's. It's me reading the studies and saying, let's just do it instead of doing another study, you know, so I know that I we're doing things, you know, semi experimentally, you know, guided by obviously by science. Um, but, you know, ultimately, it, there's no, um, it, you know, certainly when somebody comes in and right before they, they're about to start, if, if their blood pressure is low, 
you know, they themselves often are going to say, I can't start, I can't do it. But, but uh, if I see it and they're symptomatic, I mean, uh, they're, they cannot start. I have to hydrate them. They have to at least uh, um, I give them at least eight ounces of water. So a small bottle, um, you know, and then I check hydrate. their blood pressure. Dr. Cabasa, want make sure that everybody hears that word hydrate because you know people with Parkinson's do not sense their desire to drink. So right. we need that reminder and that hydration is a very key word for everything, as you said. Right. So I don't, you know, so if, if they're, if they're, you know, we had, as of yesterday, we had two people that dropped their blood pressure. So they could not start until they hydrated. And in, in, and because they were hydrating before I added some electrolyte mints, we added a little bit of salt. You know, and then they were able to go. I mean, um, I think very rarely. Pick, I think we're going to start keeping pickles in our studio. There you go. There you go. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I, I, you know, we haven't had people in the gym before class uh, with very elevated, high, high, you know, uh, blood pressures thing. So we, I haven't had to deal with that yet. Um, that would be a challenge. And at that point, you know, if it's too elevated and depending on what their heart rate is, I might keep them from, you know, from doing the session. Um, but, uh, you know, it, 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 you know, it certainly is me sending them back to the regular doctor or, or if, if, if depending on, on who's managing their blood pressure, I myself might make some changes then as well. Dr. Kapasa, I can, can I just follow up on that? Just one second. Sure. So when somebody's exercising on the floor on a mat and they, they suffer, they have uh, symptoms of NOH or, you know, they suffer from that. Um, sometimes I'll have them do some kind of uh, knee pumps laying down on the mat before they get up. Is that something that's helpful? I recommend yeah, I mean, it. Uh, yeah. I mean, a, 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 any maneuvers. I mean, the, the, you know, it, in my experience, if because I'm I'm measuring their blood pressure before and making and then hydrating them, that you know, we we don't have that happen a lot. That while they're exercising, they feel you know they start feeling lightheaded. So we you know I'm already preloading them to avoid that. Now if it still happens, which it still does, you know, um, I will sit them down. We might lay them down, feet up, you know, hydrate. But um, even um even the person that we really you know took about. 10 minutes to kind of recover um, because he really, you know, the blood pressure did really plummet. Um, you know, once he was down, feet up, hydrate, he wanted to continue the class. I'm like, no, you're done, you know, for today. But, uh, but you know, and it, it informed me because I knew that in a lot of situations, that person's going to be sent to the emergency room, you know, and in this case, we were there in the gym you know, we treated the person, they recovered, they went back home. I called them that night, I called them the next day, they were fine. They have, you know, since then they haven't had that problem happen again. But but I know that uh, um, because we knew what was happening as it was happening, we're also able to tend to it. So absolutely being aware and, and doing all the, you know, any, any maneuver that gets more blood quickly back to the brain, getting them on the floor, feet up, you know, any sort of um, leg exercises. Like I said, the legs are our second heart you know, it's going to get some of the perfusion up, you know, into the brain and, and, and have them hopefully recover. Thank you. Dr. Kabasa. thank you so much. I love this concept of you as the ringside physician. And I think more doctors should be following you. It's a great concept. We need you in our gyms and everybody needs to go to the gym and maybe see your doctor at the gym. <laughs> yes, I mean, and and um, you know, we we have we we our our fitness classes are every Wednesday from ten to uh, noon um, um, in East Harlem. Um, I can you know I can certainly you know provide some of the website and uh, and that information. Um, it's free for now, and uh, for anybody that's willing to participate, if somebody comes um, that I don't know, I mean, I do ask them to get some sort of clearance from their primary care that they can exercise at a medium to high intensity capacity. Um, but um, we have to do this. And I think, you know, my concern about all this, this is, you know, I, I love what I do, but my concern is that there's not a lot of other doctors, you know, interested in this you know, and then not a lot of doctors in general. I mean, we, you know, we're losing, you know, you know, being well, a doctor like, is... It, that's like I'm too depressed about, too depressed about what's no, happening uh, in your world well, right 
the reason I say this is because I just, I want to motivate the people, you know, I want to motivate our, our fighters because that they're the ones who control this. I mean, like, you know, we, I, part of my mission is to make our fighters educated consumers because they're the ones that can change the system. You know, I can try, but it's really our fighters. I you know everybody that's listening right now, you guys are the ones can change the system, you know, by becoming educated consumers and making these demands out of the medical system, out of, the, out of our doctors. And then, you know, I'm on my side, I'm trying to make doctoring more fun to try to lure more people in it. Yeah. Um, you know, keeping obviously the science, you know, being, for, you know, first and foremost. And, uh, and in that gym, I, I, I tell people, this is where life makes sense to me. This is where I'm not bounded by the insurance companies. This is where I can practice pure medicine. And I just want to be able to do it every day. Right now, I'm only limited to two hours every week due to funding but uh but by creating conscious you know I, I would love me and other doctors to be in the gym all the time you thank know, you to help as many Dr. people as we can please tell everybody where they could find you at moving brains Foundation. so uh, our website is movingbrainsfoundation.org uh, um and there you can click and and it'll take you you know give all the all the details we hopefully will soon you know, as we continue collaborating uh, with wonderful programs like like yours, uh, you know, we we you know very interested in creating more you know uh, online you know courses and and concepts and um, you know the 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 unique thing about the class is that we really you know it's we don't have physical therapists we have the doctor and the athlete and and we're aim we, we look for the problems that medications can solve. Or that are very, or or that are much more difficult, like balance, and you know, and just as 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 a lot of these programs, we we have to you know we have to. Recently, I heard this 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 quote: "We can't be underdosing with medication, but we can be underdosing with exercise and Parkinson's either." Absolutely. And I think that's what's been happening in general, is Absolutely. that we've been underdosing in exercise, and Absolutely. it's time to step it up. We need to get ourselves motivated and get to the gym and work out. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Cabasa. Thank you so much for coming today. Please join us in our other programs. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye.